different issues in, op in the opioid crisis in the UP and nationally. Uh, but now we would uh, like to have a presentation by uh, uh, Elise Burr, the director for the Center of Rural Health here at Northern. Uh, Elise joined Northern in July of 2020. Great timing, Elise. As the inaugural director of the NMU Center for Rural Health, she has more than 30 years of combined experience working in higher education and the healthcare industry. Elise is extremely dedicated to identifying, understanding, and addressing regional healthcare needs through collaborative efforts. The foundation of her professional success can be attributed to building relationships and partnering with agencies and businesses on initiatives that improve the health and well being of individuals. And in, additionally, she is extremely passionate about giving regional residents a voice by sharing challenges and successes with local, state, and federal legislatures, which continues to result in new and ongoing support for regional, state, and national health matters. And she's also a floor mate of mine on the first floor of Grease Hall. That's how we've got to know each other. So it's great to have you on the first floor. She's going to be talking about the UP health challenge, healthcare challenges and solutions. So please welcome Elise Berg. Thank you, Dan. Thanks for having me here today. Um, I'm going to be sharing a lot of statistics with you. Uh, there was a 320-page uh, needs assessment completed in 2018. And I did my best to condense that to a few slides versus 320 slides. So um, I will have some sources at the end as well to share with you. And I would encourage you to continue, um, I guess, researching and looking at that needs assessment for more data and how that applies to our region as well. So from a national perspective right now, there's more than 60 million Americans that live in rural areas throughout our nation. And that's roughly 20% of our population. Um, you can see in the map that's indicated here, the light green is about 19 uh, states right now that have about 20, 29%, 28.8% uh, of more than a, a rural setting in the nation. And then there tends to be a significant gap in health between rural and urban Americas, Americans. So the rural causes of death um, are more likely for rural Americans to die from either heart disease, cancer, unintentional injury, chronic respiratory diseases, and strokes. And an interesting statistic uh, that I noticed was that it used to be a lot of people thought rural areas were more likely to have cancer. And really what's been discovered is that in rural areas, there's less cancer, but it tends to be more deadly. And we'll talk a little bit about that, but a portion of that has to do with the distance to receiving care and also the timing that these types of illnesses are actually recognized. So preventative care goes a long way with some of these chronic diseases and illnesses. So there are common risk factors that are associated with the diseases. Some we can change, some we can't. Um, the unmodifiable risk factors are age, sex, and family history. The modifiable ones that we can control are an unhealthy diet, physical inactivity, substance use such as tobacco, alcohol, and opioids. And you'll see different common themes between these things um, as one of, the, one of the factors that indicated a higher cause of death was unintentional injury that was noted earlier. Substance use contributes to that. If you have people who are driving and they're impaired, that will lead to some of that unintentional injury. So a lot of the theme throughout this presentation, it just makes sense. It's just common sense things. It's just a matter of recognizing those and then understanding how we want to impact that in our region. So there's a cause and effect with the intermediate risk factors and the main chronic diseases. Having raised blood pressure, raised blood glucose, abnormal blood lipids, and being overweight or obese will contribute to the main chronic diseases of the heart disease, stroke, cancer, chronic respiratory disease, and diabetes. So something to note um, on diabetes in particular, and I'll throw out different pinpoints on this, but um, 
I recently talked to some UP regional um, diabetes educators throughout the Upper Peninsula. I asked them what it is that they need to do their job more effectively because of the diabetes rate in the Upper Peninsula. They had indicated that they don't need more money, they don't need more people trained as diabetes educators, they don't need more brochures, more education. What they really need is for people to change their behaviors. And that just made me stop and think for a minute because, you know, here I am ready to try to get resources or try to get more money. And so that, that just made me really pause because we need to really get inside of the heads of individuals and find out what is preventing them from being healthier or for taking measures to reduce some of that pre-diabetes standard that they have. So why do residents in rural areas have poorer health outcomes? Um, comes no surprise for those of us who live up here that geographic isolation can play a role in that. The environmental and occupational factors, uh, you think of mining, you think of some of the industry that existed up here for years and how that's contributing to some of our health you know, over the past 50 years. There are limited job opportunities in rural areas. There tends to be more poverty. We have higher rates of healthy risk behaviors. Again, that kind of ties to the substance use. And then we have challenges with access to care. And so that can fall into transportation, uh, affordability of healthcare services, and also the availability of healthcare services. Uh, it's really risk behaviors that are unhealthy. So if you think of like the uh, driving impaired, being under the use or being under um, detriment of having a substance use. So now a, a brief situational snapshot of what we're encountering right now in the Upper Peninsula. And I couldn't help but think of part of this when, it, when it, Jason was talking earlier about the enrollment um, at Northern. But we have an aging population right now in the Upper Peninsula. Close to 20% right now of our population is age 65 and older. And so with that, of course, comes different types of healthcare needs for this population. And so it's time for us to really take a look at how we're going to address and take care of people who are older than 65 and what do we need to do looking out to the future projection of the population. We also have a declining population. Uh, in the last 20 years, we've reduced by about 9.5% population in the Upper Peninsula. So at one point we were close to 319,000. And right now we're right around 200 and I think it's 286,000 in the Upper Peninsula. So that's, that's a pretty big decrease. Um, and you think about migration, you also think about the older population and the loss of life that might come with that and the things that can contribute to the reduce in the population. Educational attainment is important. Um, residents of all but two counties uh, from Houghton and Marquette are less likely to achieve a bachelor's degree. And the reason I bring that up, and we'll talk about that in another slide that's coming up, is because with education, there's, there's certain points and highlights in life that are going to attribute to having a healthier lifestyle. And so education is one of those factors. Now that's not to say that only those counties have people getting bachelor's degrees, but it's just an observation based on the county projection. The poverty rates right now, um, it's 9.4%, which is over almost 28,000 people in the Upper Peninsula are at poverty rate. It does range and it's been as high as 14.7%. And so that poverty rate also impacts what's happening with healthcare. Our labor force, um, I just got these statistics yesterday from Michigan Works and I thought this was interesting. The labor force number of 134,000 one person is a reflection of the unemployment and the employment. So that's a combination right now in that number. But there are more than 100,000 people who are not in the labor force that are 16 years of age or older. 
So these are a combination of people choosing not to work. Um, there could be some people on disability. There's a number of people that can fit into this category. But right now when you see a lot of signs saying they're hiring people, this is the category right now that at least a third of our population up here is not in the labor force. So health insurance coverage, um, these are the medical snapshots for the Upper Peninsula region. Uh, there are about 7% of adults that do not have uh, insurance coverage right now. Now if you take a look back to 2013, there were 18.5% residents in the Upper Peninsula that did not have insurance. And so that significant change in population was due to the Affordable Care Act being implemented. Um, that really provided a lot of opportunity for the residents in the Upper Peninsula to access health care and to be able to, to not only get like emergency care but also focus on preventative care. There are one in six adults in the Upper Peninsula that do not have a primary care medical provider. That's kind of surprising because you just assume that everybody has a doctor. Um, this is going to be more interesting I think is we have youth coming in, you know, advancing into adulthood because these days everything is turning to technology and that quick I need a doctor right the second versus establishing a long-term relationship with a provider who gets to know the family history and someone that you can confide in and work through, you know, the health path of your future. There's also one in six adults that report that cost prevented them from accessing health care services. And that could be a combination of not understanding the insurance system. That could be intimidated by kind of like the menu prices of services without understanding discounts. Uh, there's also individuals that have, they're challenged. They don't want to admit what they don't know. They don't want to be seen as somebody who doesn't understand a system and so they're afraid to ask questions. There are one in four adults that do not get a preventative physical exam in the last year. Again, these statistics are based on 2017 data right now. I did not want to get into current data because with the pandemic, I think everything is just skewed, so I don't want to put it out of perspective. Um, a note on the preventative physical exam. I, I do a lot of different community meetings, attend a lot, and participate in a lot. And at one particular meeting up in the Houghton area, there were about 30 of us healthcare individuals at the table. And we had asked how many of us ourselves working in healthcare had had a physical exam within the last year. And even though we know better, you know, we're preaching it, there were only three of us that had had a physical exam. So, you know, if that's any indication as to what's happening with our upper peninsula population, it's like we know better, but we don't take action on it. Then we have one in three adults and at least 50% of our senior citizen population that have prediabetes, and 90% don't even know it. There's so much that could be done with the prevention of going in from prediabetes to that diabetes stage. You can still reverse and stop yourself from falling into being um, diabetic by addressing you know, the, the issues that need to be addressed when you're at that pre-diabetes stage. And so that goes back to the conversation I had with the diabetes educators. You know, What do we need to do to get people to, to really understand the situation that they're in and try to reverse some of that? There are a lot of individuals who will and to no fault of their own, but they'll make excuses or they'll say, oh, it's genetic. Oh, my, you know, everybody in my family had it. But that stage, uh, that diabetes, you know, there's that particular level that, that isn't hereditary, you know, that's not genetically linked. And so you can really take control of that to increase your chances of not falling into that chronic disease in the future. Oral health and mental health. Uh, one in three adults did not have a dental did not have dental insurance and did not have dental care in the last year. Uh, Sixty percent of adults over the age of 65 lacked dental insurance. We had uh, 77 percent of adults delayed or did not receive mental health care services due to cost. And there were 5% of adults delayed 
or did not receive mental health care due to the lack of professionals in our region. The Upper Peninsula is considered a health care provider shortage area. So we do not have as many health care providers in all these different areas as we do residents. And so for that reason, there are individuals who will come to our community, move to the area in the Upper Peninsula and provide these services based on loan forgiveness programs through the government. To work in a health professional shortage area, you're able to get loan forgiveness after a three year commitment. And quite often, many of these individuals will leave after three years. And so it becomes a, a recruitment and retention type issue, not only with our providers, but also our specialty providers. And so one of the things that we could be doing is really trying to develop relationships with these individuals who are in our communities and really helping them put roots down and want to stay in the area. The other part that could contribute to this is engaging with our youth more and having them get excited about healthcare professions and wanting to return and stay in the Upper Peninsula. Uh, one of the bonuses we have going for us is that we do have a lot of youth that return to the Upper Peninsula and that stay here. And so we really try to celebrate those individuals. Um, they know it's a safe place to live. Uh, they know their community and that can be a big bonus for a lot of, a lot of our, uh, I guess our younger adolescents. So a continuation of the, the impact from that snapshot, uh, education actually impacts your health status. That's why I had mentioned um, which counties right now are kind of producing the most bachelor level. There's uh, personal behaviors based on education, your employability, and the economic development for a region. And so all these things are kind of interwoven and tied together. Employment is often tied to self-value um, quite often you have health insurance when you're employed and again there's that sole underlying theme of economic development for the Upper Peninsula. Health insurance impacts health care access. You're more likely to go to a doctor if you have health insurance. You're more likely to have better outcomes if you go to a physician. And lastly poverty impacts health and it can impair future economic potential. So when we take a look at our population, I mean, everything really revolves around health. You know, if, if you don't have your health, what, what do we have in the region? You can't keep your business open. You can't keep employees. Um, it all just trickles down. So I really try to think of uh, like Maslow's hierarchy of needs. When it comes to health, you know, we can, we can preach to people and say, oh, you need to see your doctor every year and get a physical. But the reality of the situation is that there are a number of individuals, more than the 28% that are already identified in poverty, that are having challenges met right now in just meeting their day-to-day -day needs. So if with the physiological needs, you know, there's air, water, food, shelter, sleep, clothing, these are basic needs. There's a lot of people that are even challenged with these. I mean, we know that we have, um, Challenges right now with access to food and high quality food, not just frozen, not just processed. That second level safety needs talks about personal security, employment, resources, health, and having property. So if you're challenged with that first level, it's really hard for you to think about that next level. And that's not to say you can't be challenged with both at the same time. But if you think about it, um, I worked in a community where you know, the choices they had to make were, I can either put gas in my car and go to work and put food on the table, or I could go in and have a, a dental exam and get my teeth cleaned. So what, what's gonna take the, you know, what's gonna take precedence in that situation? And so what's not uncommon right now is that people will not receive preventative care because of these situations, and they only go to a doctor or an emergency room because something has advanced so far. And so some of these things can be pre prevented ahead of time and dealt with when they're in healthier stages and easier to you know, address some of the illnesses that they have prior to getting to that level. But it's really hard because you can't just sit there and preach to these people what they should be doing. We have to really understand the situation that they're in. 
You might hear the term social determinants of health being thrown around. Um, that's something that I am very passionate about. Again, that kind of contributes to Maslow's pyramid. Uh, there are six different areas, seven different areas. It's economic stability, neighborhood and physical environment. Again, the education theme, food, community and social context, and then access to the healthcare system. So right now there are, there's a position that had come kind of to fruition in the last five or six years called the community health worker. And at a lot of the outpatient clinics at federally qualified health centers, and more recently, UP Health System at Marquette, Bell, and Portage have implemented this type of position. Now this is, as of right now, not a position that somebody can bill for. So it's not a sustainable position. But these individuals will identify what challenges the patients might be having right now in these other areas. Because if transportation is an issue, what's the likelihood that they're gonna to get to their appointments? And can doctor offices decrease the amount of no-show appointments that are occurring on their daily schedules? If somebody doesn't have access to food, what's the likelihood that they're gonna be healthier if that's one of the conditions right now that they're experiencing? And so these community health workers actually help to link people to resources in their community. And there's a difference between just referring somebody and saying, oh, you need to, you need to take advantage of your SNAP food benefits. And actually setting up an appointment for them. You know, maybe some of these community health workers even attend the appointment with the patient if the patient really is struggling to, to make that move. And then they follow up to make sure that they've actually accessed that service. And, and that's huge. Um, the community health workers are, <laughs> we need to dance. <laughs> the community health workers, um, I, I see them as a vital part, you know, really to helping to contribute to the, uh, the healthcare system. Um, they're individuals that live in the community where the patients are. They understand what patients are going through. It's not uncommon for patients to have, to be challenged, I guess, to open up and admit to a physician what they might be going through. And so the community health worker is somebody who's at their level that understands, and there tends to be less shame and admission of what they might need assistance with. And there's, there's so much positive that's come out of this particular role. They're working in the state of Michigan right now to advance this as a career path and to actually make it a sustainable position. Personally, I would like to see community health workers also implemented beyond the healthcare system. I could see a need for them to be at universities or colleges. If these uh, different types of topics are actually impacting health, they're more than likely impacting more than health. And so I think it would be great to have that identified up front and be able to connect people to uh, resources. So how do we move forward you know, in our region? Um, the main points that I see are really collaborating, uh, exploring different partnerships, and this can go beyond the region. It could be at the state level, it could be at the national level. Uh, we need to leverage funding opportunities. There is a lot of silos in the Upper Peninsula uh, with a lot of different initiatives and efforts, and I give everybody credit for putting time and effort into trying to solve something that they see but I really wanna get people to recognize how much more could be done if we can get places to work together. Um, we can increase awareness about our situation. So um, understanding right now what that pre-diabetes population is in the UP, you know, that will hopefully, you know, the more we talk about it, the more people will take it upon themselves to find out what their status is and to make changes and to be healthier. We need to not only identify the challenges, which today I've only named a few, but we also need to take a look at solutions. And I think it's time to not necessarily repeat whatever worked 30 years ago will work now, but take a look at some innovative approaches to this. Take a look at what hasn't been done. And don't think about, oh, this will never work. You know, Just bring it up and let's find a way to work together and see if it will happen. We also need to increase advocacy efforts um, I've done a lot of work with the Michigan Primary Care Association and the Michigan State Office of Rural Health. I've gone to Washington, D.C. every year to help advocate. 
I think we really need to talk to our public about learning what they can do. A lot of people don't know what to do. And so I think if we can start with these small steps in teaching people how can they be an advocate, we could really help, I guess you could say, move the needle on some of the things that are happening in the healthcare system. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about an experience I had. I uh, was given, somebody had called me because a senator was coming to the Upper Peninsula and was gonna be talking about trying to reduce prescription drug costs. And so I was asked to line up a pharmacist to come to the event to also talk about what's happening at local pharmacies. So in that process, the pharmacist actually disclosed something um, that maybe he shouldn't have, but he did, <laughs> and talked about a gag order that was placed on pharmacists at the time. And what this meant was that when a patient would show up, they would give their insurance card and they would pay $10 copay for a prescription. Had they not presented their insurance card, that prescription may have cost them 50 cents. But because of the gag order on the pharmacist, the pharmacist couldn't tell them, put your insurance card away. Well, when the senator heard this, um, she, was, she was just shocked, like just had no idea. And of course, how would you know it when there's a gag order, right? So within the next six to eight months, that gag order was removed. And I'm absolutely convinced it was because if you don't know what's happening, how can you fix it? And so by really understanding what's happening in the healthcare system, I think that there are individuals, I mean, I truly believe that want to make a difference and want to make an impact, but it's a matter of telling our story, you know, highlighting what's happening. Um, my particular website, um, we share different blog stories throughout the Upper Peninsula. We highlight the individuals working in the healthcare system we talk about patient stories. We need to capture that story and tell that story well. And we'll be able to do more with legislation and advocacy efforts if we can do that. We also need to support the efforts and the accomplishments that are happening in the healthcare field. We need to recognize the impacts and how that trickles down to everything from the economy to our education, to our happiness, to our well being. And we need to engage in initiatives that are taking place. Understanding, of course, capacity is one thing. If your hands are full, I get it. But there are opportunities to also be able to support different initiatives that are happening, which aren't necessarily time consuming or accepting of you know, finances. So, so I'm gonna talk for just a few minutes about the Northern Michigan Center for Rural Health. Uh, we were founded, as Dan had mentioned, last year in July. Heck of a year to start a new job. Small thing like a pandemic happening. Not the best time to try to meet people in hospitals and clinics. So I wasn't really able to get too much attention from the external factor through that. So the mission of the center is to improve the health and well-being of UP residents and communities by developing collaborative partnerships that improve the access and availability of affordable quality health care services. Uh, the goals of the center are to expand access to comprehensive health care services, to improve the quality of essential health care services, to address regional health priorities by identifying and advancing solutions, and to strengthen the rural health care system as a whole. It doesn't sound too overwhelming, but there's a lot that goes behind this. <laughs> So I'm gonna give you a few examples of some of the projects that have been taking place and that will be taking place just to show you the wide variety of ways that this can impact our region. So knowing of course that I couldn't get in with hospitals and clinics, the first thing I thought was putting our regional universities and colleges together in a flu shot competition. So last fall we had all four universities in the Upper Peninsula um, decided to agree to this and it was quite fun for the populations to get involved. They were ecstatic about focusing on something that had nothing to do with COVID. And although the ultimate rates uh, were underwhelming when you looked at the percentages that were vaccinated on campus, the amazing thing was that every university reached a high record level for their university campuses. So I mean I really think that uh, making it fun and engaging people was one aspect to doing that. So in running this competition this year, we were able to get two of the four colleges actually to join us. So this year, Bay Dinoc Community College 
and Keweenaw Bay Ojibwa Community College will be joining us. And next year, Gogebic and Bay Mills Community College will be joining as well. So then we'll have everyone in the Upper Peninsula. So I look forward to that. There was also a digital divide project that took place with community action agencies. There were four counties in the UP that had contacted me and said, we have money from CARES Act funding. We're not sure what to do with it. Do you have any ideas? So we talked about their clients and what was important. These are individuals that are challenged uh, with housing, with food, um, lower income levels. So what we decided to do was use Northern Michigan University's purchase power to buy iPads for their clients. Uh, there were about 200 people approximately served by this. And then in addition to that, we were able to provide one-year contract services for broadband access. And so the advantage to this is that those clients were then able to access not only educational resources, but telehealth appointments during the pandemic. So this was an alternative option to seeing their doctors and taking care of themselves at a very challenging time in the nation. And uh, I, they were so appreciative of that opportunity. And so that's something that hadn't really occurred in the past that uh, are things that, that's how we're looking at these partnerships and what could we do if we actually work together. We're also focused on healthcare workforce recruitment and retention. Um, you may have heard in the news recently, there's a lot happening with nursing shortages right now in the Upper Peninsula, a lot of challenges, a lot of people leaving the healthcare workforce, they've had it over the last year. Um, we really need to focus on this as a region together. And a lot of hospitals and clinics work independently. It's every, every place for themselves right now when it comes to recruiting. This fall, I've been doing focus groups with administrators of healthcare facilities to talk about what is working and what's not working right now with their efforts. Uh, we did one on the east side, we did one on the west side, and we'll be doing a virtual option in Marquette within the next few weeks. The interesting thing is that we're getting different answers depending on the regions. And so what you think might be an easy answer or something that you're hearing, it, it does vary by location. And so that's important to understand that those solutions are probably gonna vary by location as well. Then next year in June, uh, I'm working with Michigan Works and what we're gonna do is we're gonna have a, a UP Healthcare Workforce Summit that'll be held here at Marquette at Northern. And it's going to really show a snapshot of the job vacancies in the healthcare industry over the last year in the Upper Peninsula, as well as bring to light uh, what we've learned in these focus groups, and also um, boots on the ground type survey responses from people actually in the healthcare industry. And the intent of this is really to get everybody in the room, one, let them know that they're not in it alone, we're all going through some of the same challenges, but also to say, what are we gonna do now to work together on this? and not apply it to just our own individual agencies. And I look forward to bringing in um, state and national resources to that, to let people know that there are systems and individuals out there that can also help uh, with the recruitment and retention efforts that we, we have. Uh, we also had a National Rural Health Day essay scholarship competition the last two years. So this was a way to engage high school seniors who are considering a healthcare career. I thought it was really important to, to think about the youth because 10 years from now, they're not gonna be our youth anymore. They're gonna be the ones helping to take care of us. So last year, the topic uh, talked about preventative care and how important that is and what challenges do they see with preventative care in the region. There are people you know, that have worked in the healthcare industry for 30 years. We hear the same thing every year. We don't see a lot of fluctuation but youth have a fresh perspective. They see what's happening in their house, in their schools, and I thought it was important to give them a voice and listen to some of what they had said. One of the interesting um, answers I thought last year that really stuck out to me was um, they thought a solution right now was to have traveling doctors and nurses throughout the UP that would only stay in a community one week and move on to the next. And the reason they wanted that, which, I, I mean, I was thinking, how's that gonna work, you know? But the reason they wanted that was they said, we live in a small community. We're, we're afraid of being judged by our health condition. We're afraid of being judged by what we might show up for an appointment for. And so the less people in my community that know what I'm going through, the better. I don't want anyone to judge me. And 
Never, never would have thought of that perspective before from somebody who's younger. And so I think hearing where people are coming from and listening to them and then thinking about that as we move forward, um, as we develop processes and protocols and the ways that we approach our, our patient population is really important. This year, our essay competition talked about our emergency management services, our ambulance system, and our paramedics and EMTs. Um, you may have noticed in the last several months that we're challenged with that population as well for recruitment and retention. So we asked youth to help identify ways that our communities can support our local EMT agencies and EMS agencies. And we're just getting ready to read the essays this weekend, so I'm excited to see what they think. I think that it's, it's providing more highlight and a spotlight on what's occurring in our region. And I really look forward to the youth being a part of that solution because friends talk to friends, talk to families, and so it's just one way to, to continue increasing that awareness. There's a hepatitis C project right now, uh, North Care Network, uh, had reached out and said they're trying to increase the screening of hepatitis C in our communities. And so what we did with that was we actually paired them up with a mass media communication class here at Northern. And th what they did was they actually screened the class ahead of time to find out what did they know about hepatitis C. And then the class actually learned about it, worked on messaging on various platforms for how to educate people about hepatitis C. And then they uh, will be surveying the students again at the end of the semester to find out what did they learn as a result of this project. Well, a lot of the people who are at risk for hepatitis C happen to be around the age of the student's parents. And so more than likely, we anticipate Thanksgiving meal might come around this conversation with the parents. <laughs> But more importantly, um, as we take a look at how did that roll out on campus with this initiative, how can we then take that to a regional level and increase the awareness about hepatitis C throughout the region and overall increase the screening rates in the Upper Peninsula? Um, diabetes initiatives, we've been working on those over the last year. The big thing we try to do is not duplicate or replicate what's already being done. We're trying to take um, some new approaches to this. Uh, we'll be working with another class on the diabetes messaging this year, similar to the hepatitis C initiative. We have a one minute um, take a test to determine if you may be at risk for prediabetes on our website. We had, I think within a three month period, close to 600 people that had accessed that test. And so we wanna continue to promote that to have people actually um, take that one minute test to determine their level. It then links them to a number of resources and encourages them to follow up with their physician if they're um, determined to be at risk. Food insecurity, so this goes back to Maslow's pyramid, right? And then how do we advance to health? So food insecurity is uh, an issue in the Upper Peninsula. Uh, one of the projects that we're working on right now, we had received a $200,000 grant this summer to, from the Michigan Health Endowment Fund. And the partners on this grant are NMU being the lead, and then we're partnering with UP Food Exchange, the um, Central UP Planning and Development, MSU Extension, and Feeding America. So we have some very strong players at the table for this grant. And what we're doing is we're gonna be um, doing a feasibility study, a business plan, and a capital campaign plan over the next two years to determine what would happen if we were able to put in a light produce processing facility and food storage distribution warehouse in the Upper Peninsula. Right now, we heavily rely on out of state or downstate to support the Upper Peninsula. This will engage farmers throughout the UP. They don't have a facility right now that can do this kind of work for them. So if they did, what would be the likelihood that they could either grow different types of vegetables or additional vegetables or fruits if they had a facility that could do this? Then we need to take a look at the actual distribution of food and how is that occurring throughout the Upper Peninsula. There was a foundation on the west side of um, Michigan that had already indicated, let us know when you get this going, you know, we're ready to write a check. So um, you know, it's no secret that this could be a big change for the Upper Peninsula and really help increase that access to food. 
Uh, Feeding America is not looking to leave the UP, should this work. Um, they want to increase their efficiencies throughout the UP. And so, for example, I'll just give you a quick example. They come up with a truck once a week to the Upper Peninsula. They drop off their food throughout the Upper Peninsula. When they leave, they're going back downstate empty. So if they're leaving Houghton area and they're empty and they're coming through Marquette and going to the eastern side of the UP, who's to say they couldn't stop at this facility, pick up produce, and then distribute that to the eastern side? So these are all types of things that we're going to be investigating to see what the likelihood is of this. Um, in no way does this mean that Northern Michigan University is going to take on building this facility, but this is to really develop the blueprints and to provide the support and the background work that needs to be done to take a look at something like this. Um, community health workers, I mentioned a little bit about them earlier. Uh, I would like the Center for Rural Health to be a train-the-trainer hub for all community health workers in the Upper Peninsula. I will be going after a grant uh, in a couple weeks. What I have asked is for the Michigan Center for Rural Health, they're the state office of rural health, I've actually asked them to be the lead applicant versus applying for the grant myself. And the reason why is because when that grant application shows up to the federal government, they're going to recognize the state office immediately versus me, you know, up here in Marquette, Michigan. So the likelihood that it could be funded will be greater than if I had independently tried to do that. And so this would allow us to hire an individual to be the train the trainer and subcontract different areas throughout the UP for that particular training. Uh, emergency medical services, I, I talked about that a little bit earlier, um, big challenges up here. Um, this is a situation where downstate you have large healthcare systems that are paying individuals to go to school to get certified and then providing their books and then also guaranteeing to pay them and place them right in a position. We don't necessarily have that luxury up here in the Upper Peninsula. A majority of these people are either volunteers, paid volunteers, there are some that are full-time, which is fortunate, but when you live in a really rural area, what are the odds that you're gonna get calls on a regular basis to have steady income? And so we need to work with our population and understanding what can they contribute to this, um, could they get even a, the first responder level of training and be able to give back to their community? There are a lot of people in this profession right now in the Upper Peninsula that are getting ready to retire, their retirement age. They're only gonna be able to do this so long. So how do we talk to youth about staying in the UP, getting this kind of certification? We've had 10 different EMS agencies close in the last three years. That means that somebody else now is transporting people farther than what they anticipated. You're waiting longer for an ambulance to show up, and what does that do to increase or decrease what could happen as a result of that longer transport? I'm not a specialist in any of these particular areas, but my goal is that I connect with those who are to try to continue moving those efforts forward. So this is a list of the sources that I used for some of the data that I shared with you. Um, again, the Western UP Health Department had conducted that needs assessment in 2018 for the Upper Peninsula. They will be releasing the next assessment within the next couple months. They did surveys throughout the region this summer, so there will be new statistics. The 2018 version was the first time the Upper Peninsula was overall taken into consideration. So it'll be very interesting to compare what comes out this winter to what occurred three years ago. So we'll be able to see what's happening, what's transitioning, what's trending upward or downward with our health. I have my contact information listed. Um, for those of you who were able to attend in person, um, I have available the list of the goals and objectives of the Center for Rural Health. Um, I included a page that talked about access to care. And I gave a snapshot of this uh, UP Needs Assessment Guide. It breaks down all the health statistics in every single county in the Upper Peninsula. So not only is it just interesting to read and to see where our, our population sits, it's also a fantastic resource to use if you're considering grant opportunities. All right, thank you very much, Elise. Thank you, it was an excellent presentation. Does anyone have any questions for Elise? Sure. 
Thank you. I have a question. I, I, I'm teaching a class on UP uh, popular culture, and yesterday we did food. And so I not only did we talk about Uper food, I brought a bunch of Uper food. And uh, I asked them, what do all of these have in common? And the answer was, they're all bad for you. <laughs> Other than the wild rice I made, uh, dish I made, everything else was very high in carbohydrates, fat, sugars, um, and you talk about diabetes, and, I, and it hits me very close to home because I, I got diagnosed two years ago with diabetes because I loved Uper food and uh, being sedentary, and, and we talked about these issues, you know, why is this an issue in the UP, and what can we do about it? So what are your thoughts about that? I know that you had talked about bringing in Elizabeth Monte originally to be a part of this, um, and, and, and you guys talked about this somewhat. Part of it is really taking a look at the access to food. Um, I'm not knocking pasties by any means, because who doesn't love a good pasty? But um, it, pasty, for example, that's tradition. I mean, that was because of miners and, and taking food, you know, to work and and how they manage their their dietary needs during the day. Um, there's a there's a difference between moderation with what we do. And I think sometimes that falls into it. Um, I think it's a combination of understanding what we might be going through psychologically. Um, there's your binge eating that occurs. Um, quite often, it's not um, unusual to think about behavioral health components. Um, I think about, um, like in the medical office where I worked, we did integrated care. And uh, it was a combination of behavioral health and physical health. So it was understanding that I'm overeating, and, and the reason why is because I'm depressed, or maybe it's because I'm anxious or I'm stressed. So if you're, not, if you're just telling someone you need to lose weight here, go exercise and eat better, it's not addressing the issue that may be causing them to do this. And so actually looking at the full person, the whole person, and addressing what are their psychological needs right now, and can I teach them a coping technique? Um, that's one aspect. Um, I do think about all the healthy things that are in the Upper Peninsula, the berries, you know, the, the vegetable gardens that are being grown. This processing facility would help extend that life a bit since we have a shorter growing season. The other thing I think about, um, I know you're tying it to UP Foods. The other thing that I think about, though, is um, just the, the availability. Um, I think of a community where I worked where the only thing in that, that community was a party store. And you needed a car to get to the grocery store. And the grocery store was 10 miles away. But if you really wanted to go to the largest grocery store that had the best prices, that was 25 miles away. And so if you didn't have a car, you had to take a bus. And then you had to wait for the bus. You had the bus transport that's stopping all the time at the various stops. And then you can only buy so much of what you can carry. So when you have the option between buying $5 of a you know, round asparagus or $10 of frozen pizzas and getting 10 of them, what's gonna last you longer? You know, and then there's the challenge with understanding what to do with foods. Um, how do you freeze them? How do you, you know, how do you use them? We did a food project out at K.I. Sawyer a few years ago, and I had people that had only had uh, canned vegetables. They had never had some of the fresh vegetables that we brought to Sawyer, and it was just fascinating because they said they didn't know they loved spinach as much as they do now. You know, and some, some admittedly said, I don't know what to do with it. So we actually did cooking classes at the same time and taught people what to do with that, you know, with that food. I also have to believe that something about advancing technology and uh, motors has significantly contributed to our waistlines. Um, I was talking to a student, probably somebody from your class, Dan, that was talking about Uber food. And uh, we talked about, we have kayaking, we have canoeing, we have cross-country skiing, we have all these outdoor things that we could do, and then we have motor boats, we have jet skis, we have everything that's put a motor on it so that we're less likely to do physical activity because it's more fun now that we have a motor, we can go faster. So I really think it's just the frame of mind and what we choose to do and, and how that can impact our health ultimately. That was a long answer. <laughs> no, that's a great, a great answer. You have a question? I have one more thing I wanted to say. Uh, we were recently at Rabbit Bay up in the Copper Country, and a person arrived and had a seizure. 
It took a little over an hour to assemble that group to get them. Luckily, there were a few, and I was one, having been a teacher, knew a little bit about clearing the air around him and you know doing it. But boy, if you're in the Copper Country, you're up at Cedar Bay, you're up at you know, and you have to have an ambulance to come and get you. You are a long way out, and that's really rural. Yeah. Absolutely right. There are a lot of people who move to the UP because they want to be alone, because they don't want neighbors, because they don't. And then there's these other things that are, can be a downside, right? And so part of that is really increasing the awareness of what, what that expectation is. I mean, we have television the last 10 years that have shown, oh, yeah, you call 911, they'll be there in two minutes. That's a false expectation up here in the Upper Peninsula. One of the things that we're going to be doing this winter, hopefully, I'm trying to solidify funds for this, but I actually want to do a survey to the public about EMS and what their understanding is. And the survey also provides the answer at the same time that it's asking a question. So it'll say, yes, you are right. Here's the correct, you know, or no, you're not right. Here's the situation. The EMS agencies are not publicly funded like police and like fire. A lot of people think they are, but they're not. Um, the question is, should they be? If this is a, a life expectancy and we all expect this as a right, you know, in our communities, absolutely they should be. And so that's a legislative type of move that has to occur. It's a systemic thing. But with the survey, uh, it's going to inform the public about the state of what's happening right now and what we can do to advance that. And um, one of the slides I had indicated, um, I'll just flip back for a second here, unless it doesn't let me. Um, I do have a paper, it was a recently, they call it a white paper, that was tied to explain what's happening in right now in the rural areas. And this is available on my website. So please feel free to access this just to take a look at what the recent results are of what's happening in our rural area. Yeah, Jen. Thank you. This is very impressive how much you've been able to accomplish, particularly, as you said, uh, coming here with, with the start of COVID. Thank you very much for all you've done to knit these things together. It's very impressive. Um, if you had a magic wand, what would you say would be the, I think, these are probably your top things, I'm assuming, or these are what you could get funded. I understand. I've been there. Um, but what would, you, what would you like to see come top two, three things that you would like to see happen next? Whew. Well, I think addressing the food insecurity is one thing. And I think it's something that our region can do if we all work together on it. Um, I think there's a lot of opportunities for partnerships that people don't see. And I think that if they open their eyes and think outside the box, that by working together, we can leverage a lot more. And I guess I'll give you an example on that. I think about there's a lot of money coming out during COVID that has to do with um, education. And there's a lot that's coming out related to health care. Now, if that money was combined and put together and used to build out broadband and strengthen broadband in rural areas where people could have more access to telehealth services or educational resources, wouldn't that be something? instead of having these separate pools of money where you can only do so much because you only have so much money. So I'd really like to see that happen. Um, uh, these are all just broad strokes, you know, on, on what could happen, but I think it's just increasing awareness. And if people want something to change, it'll change. So whether it's their behavior or whether it's working together to accomplish something, it can happen if people want it to happen. So I think a lot of it is just getting people to understand the current situation. I, yeah. One of the things you talked about, I, I, I agree. I, if I didn't have this in my hand, I'd be clapping too. <laughs> you talked about food access. And I drive to Duluth to see family a lot. And it's a joke in our family. Between Ishpeming and Ironwood, we call it the food desert. Um, because not only are there very few grocery stores that have like a wide variety of things, there are very few restaurants. 
that provide any anything other than burgers and fries and uh, something from the Gordon Food Service. Um, and it, it, it's a real issue. I mean, when you're driving there, you can't eat healthy in a lot of those communities unless you are yourself a good cook. Yeah. Um, it, it's challenging. I mean, I, I don't blame people for understanding that 10 pizzas can feed you longer than $10 worth of fresh vegetables. I mean, I understand why they make the decisions they do, but I don't think they understand the repercussions of those decisions and the lifelong you know, impact that it has on their health. I think about um, low-income housing and people who are in poverty and how children are being raised. Um, I mean, there's so many topics that I didn't even get into, like prenatal care and, you know, suicide and, and you know, sexual activity and just all these. There's so much related to health and time constraints. We only have so long, but um, I really think about the youth. I mean, I think about the future and what's happening and how can we impact that now because it won't be long before they are our current you know our current population are there any other questions or comments for uh, for elise well if not elise thank you so much for a wonderful presentation um we're going to wrap this one up we'll start at 10:30 with the uh, opioid crisis so thank you very much <laughs>